So tonight I'm going to talk about this photograph in particular, Barbara Bosworth's Ovenbird with Kathy from 2004 that was included in our special virtual exhibition, Finding Meaning. And I want to talk a little bit about some of the pictures I included in that exhibition. And then I'm going to go into more depth about Barbara Bosworth's work to give you a sense of how this particular picture fits into Barbara's work overall. Um, and then I'd be happy to take some questions. So beginning with this picture, uh, I want to talk a little bit about what the Finding Meaning exhibition was to give you a little bit of context for why I'm talking about this image in particular. Um, at the beginning of the shutdown with the pandemic, uh, the curatorial and education teams at the center tried to figure out how we could do something to respond to what we were collectively going through while acknowledging the individuality of people's experience as they moved through um, the shutdowns from the pandemic and the, the demonstrations around racial justice. And so what we decided to do was take a series of themes. There were five pairs of words that we considered and they were connection, isolation, wellness, illness, solace, discomfort, presence, absence, and communal domestic. And so as a group of five of us from the curatorial and education departments, we looked to the collection online and pulled together a large group of images that for us, we felt connected to or spoke to those five pairs of themes. And then from that larger body of images from the center's collection, we each selected between 15 and 22 or 23. We sequenced those images into a, a slideshow essentially, and then wrote a first person narrative that addressed our experience and how we were thinking about images personally in this moment of the pandemic. Um, so this was, I don't know, maybe June or July by the time we were working on this. Um, and, and then also maybe addressed some of the images specifically to talk about how or why those particular pictures had made it into our selection and felt particularly resonant to us. And so this was one of the images that I included. And I think for me, when I, when I looked back over the images that I chose, um, it, it, I think that part of what I was responding to was the, the, the feeling of isolation, certainly that many of us who live alone um, experienced at that time. Um, but also the kind of the, the intimacy and the tenderness of the gesture in this picture, I think particularly struck me. And I think for me, part of what was really a, a kind of prominent sense in those early months was the notion that people were getting sick and were being hospitalized without their families and that they were going through this illness alone and that um, the family members were separated from their, their um, family member who was sick. And there was, there was all of this touching and comforting that couldn't happen because of that circumstance. And that felt really um, frightening to me, very upsetting to me. And so I was really concentrating on the ways that these pictures suggested uh, touch and gesture. So this was one of the ones I chose. Uh, this image by Susan Bank called Pipo and Chichi from 2004, to me also conveyed that sense of touch. Part of what I love about this image is that the two men um, aren't looking at each other. There's a, a sense of physical distance between them. And yet the one man's hand on the other man's wrist demonstrates a kind of intimacy and connection and acknowledgement of relationship that you don't see in any other way in their body language or in, in the way that they relate to one another. Um, so that, that sense of touch and how 
important it can be to convey um, care or closeness or loyalty felt really prominent to me in this particular picture. And then this is another image I included by Charles Harbett. This is his son, Charles, with cherries on Cushing's Island, Maine from 1968. And um, so, in terms of the gesture and the way that I was connecting to that in this picture, there's something so wonderfully simultaneously adult about the way that the boy is posing and sitting there at the table, and yet also very um, innocent and, and free, which was something that I was definitely struggling with, with my own kids and their experience and the kind of limitations and restrictions that they had put upon them and the way that I could feel them missing these normal summer experiences. Um, and for me, the minimal qualities of this composition really help concentrate us on the child and his body language and his expression and help us inhabit his thinking in that particular moment. And then finally, this image by Sonia Noskoviak of Jean Richardson from 1934, um, I did talk about uh, addressed specifically in my narrative um, that accompanies the video. And for me, this picture, I, I can't help when I see pictures like this, um, a portrait that shows an unexpected physical detail of someone, um, to think about the way that that person's closest people, their, their loved ones, would recognize this, you know, the way that she's used the hairpins to create the bun at the back of her neck, or the, the line of her jaw, or the shape of her ear, or the way that even the way that the sun is glinting off of her hair, the, the wisp of hair that she's tucked behind her ear, the, the way in which all of those very minute physical details represent such a degree of intimacy to a person who you've lived with and, and who knows you. And so again, I was thinking about this and thinking about when a person dies, those kinds of knowledges of a person go away because you don't ever have those moments to see those things again. And this photograph for me represents a kind of being able to hold on to those, those tiny, subtle, nuanced aspects of knowing someone that you're really close to. So those are some of the pictures that I included in the exhibition. And what I want to do now is talk a little bit more about Barbara Bosworth. So this is a portrait of me and Barbara at Peter McGill's gallery, Pace McGill in New York City in 2014. And I first met Barbara in 2003 when I was doing research for the Ansel Adams exhibition at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston that I was hired to work on. And uh, for a short time, my colleague Karen Haas and I imagined that we might uh, curate a supplementary exhibition about landscape in the contemporary moment. And Karen Haas has, in fact, gone on to curate that show. And it's currently it's installed at the Portland, Oregon Art Museum. It's called Ansel Adams in Our Time. And it will be opening in Portland shortly. But that was how I met Barbara Bosworth. She was a large format landscape photographer and someone that Karen felt really reflected a kind of new investigation of the landscape with a, a very contemporary approach and someone she would have wanted to feature in this exhibition. So I met her then. And then in 2007, I came to the Center for Creative Photography in a joint appointment with the Phoenix Art Museum. And at that time I curated an exhibition of Barbara's work. Um, so here's an installation view from that 2008 exhibition. Uh, the show is called Human Nature, the photographs of Barbara Bosworth. And all of Barbara's work deals with the connection between people and nature. And, but we see it in lots of different ways. And in some cases, it's a very conceptual relationship between people and nature. And in other cases, it's very literal and very direct. 
So now I wanna step you through some of Barbara's work to give you a sense of what that looks like in her work overall. And then we'll end with some pictures of some more of the bird pictures. So you can see how the oven bird with Kathy picture fits into that larger project. So uh, early on, um, Barbara began a series of pictures um, in 1991 of hunters and she, she was interested in the way in which hunting obviously originally was about sustenance and required a very keen knowledge of, of nature, of wilderness in order to be a proficient hunter. And so she began a study and, and a series of portraits of hunters. She only photographed hunters who hunted to eat their kill. So that was a particular narrowing of her focus. But she, what she was struck by as she spent time with these hunters, so she would join a party and go out with them on a, a hunting expedition. What she was really surprised by was the degree to which uh, hunters and environmentalists were the same. The, the passion that they had for being in the wilderness, their, the acuity that they had developed for understanding things like the weather and uh, navigation and, and stars um, were, were really quite similar. And it was, I think it helped her open up to a more a willing stance in thinking about what kinds of engagements between people and nature she was willing to entertain and, and wanting to embrace. She has done a whole series of pictures of people engaged with nature and they take all kinds of different forms. This triptych is of her parents in Rocky Mountain National Park. And this is a picture that's always really resonated with me because what she's showing us is the way that her dad uh, engaged with nature by looking at the long view. He wanted to look at the horizon and the overall perspective. Whereas her mom is crouched down and looking at the wildflowers that are growing alongside the water. And that was the way it always was in my family too. My dad was about looking at the mountains or at the sunset um, or at the sky. And my mom was the one looking at the tide pools and the, and the little creatures. Um, so this really made a lot of sense to me. She also includes pictures like this in her work about um, people and nature, just natural phenomenon and the way that we derive a sense of a value or wonder or connection to something outside of ourselves in the process of engaging with nature. So this is called Amy with Bubble from 2000, a print that's in the center's collection. And then this is another one of these wonderful pictures. This is her dad and Barbara has projected a solar eclipse down into her father's hands. And so we see the, the sun with a little tiny bite out of it as uh, the eclipse is just beginning. But again, it's the notion of the way in which we relate to our fathers and, and the ways in which they contain the world in their hands to us, but also that this is a specific natural phenomenon that we're, we're watching happen. So then another one of her big projects is called Champion Trees. And this, I, this is perhaps one of my favorite projects. Barbara um, was interested in making portraits of the trees that are on the National Register of Big Trees. And this is a nationwide process in which people designate a champion of each native and naturalized species of tree in the United States. And it's all done kind of on a, on a state level by local volunteers who track the information. And Barbara engaged with those folks in each state as she went around to make portraits of the trees. And the champion is the one that is the, that has the largest canopy, the largest circumference of trunk and the tallest height for its particular species. And so these pictures don't actually show any humans necessarily, but what she's interested in is our human impulse to award champion status to trees. 
because of course the trees don't care whether or not they are the champion of their species. So she was interested in this very interesting, perhaps strange impulse of ours to uh, organize and, and, and give awards to trees of all things. And so this particular um, national champion is an emery oak from here in Arizona that she made in 2001. And just a, a quick technical note, the black lines that you see a third of the way through the picture on either side are representing three separate eight by 10 inch negatives that Barbara made sequentially of the scene, which is why they don't match up completely perfectly. And then she prints those three negatives side by side to create this triptych. So it's actually three separate photographic negatives printed all together to make one photograph. She also did a project on meadows and meadows are transition grasslands that are maintained by human intervention. So mowing, um, grazing or fire. So meadows don't stay meadows unless we keep them that way. Otherwise the trees fill back in and, and they become forests again. So this is another example where if you don't understand meadows, you might not appreciate why they are a reflection of a human engagement in nature, but she has done very extensive work on meadows and in fact produced this book called The Meadow, working with a biological scientist about meadow ecology. And this was produced by Radius Books, all about Barbara's in-depth work on meadows. And then um, finally, I wanna talk about birds and I'm gonna spend just a few minutes talking about birds and then I'll be ready to take any questions that you might have. So, um, Europeans be began the practice of banding individual birds several hundred years ago. And that practice in North America has become quite extensive over the last 200 years. And it's used um, to understand things like migration, behavior, social structure, lifespan, survival rate, reproductive rate, and population growth. And the way that we band birds in the United States is that we catch them with nets and then these very highly trained and dedicated volunteers catch the birds out of the nets or pull the birds out of the nets, uh, take down all the information they need about the bird, place the band on the bird's leg and then release the bird. And so Barbara did this series of pictures, portraits, of the birds as they're being held by the, the bird banders. And um, again, you can see that all of these pictures, not just Oven Bird with Kathy, is very much about the literal physical connection between humans and the birds and the way in which that is expressed in the subtle elements of body language in the person's hand and in their overall countenance. And so what I wanna do is just quietly take a minute and show you some of these pictures so you can appreciate the larger series that Oven Bird with Kathy comes from. And so in this picture, part of the reason that I like it so much is the Kathy's downturned face as she looks at the bird that she holds in her hands creates a kind of uh, circle, a kind of connection between the, the physical quality of her hands holding the bird and her attention 
which is focused 100% on the bird that she's holding. And as Barbara has talked about this, you know, the birds are distressed. Um, they, you know, they've been caught in a net, they're fearful for their lives. And so the banders have to be incredibly gentle and sensitive to the birds well-being in order to not to not kill or injure the birds. And so even though these pictures appear so peaceful and so quiet, they really take a kind of heightened sensitivity on the part of the person to make sure that they are gentle and kind to the birds um, and that and that it all works out okay. So with that, I'd like to um, thank you all for coming and I'll come back and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Becky. Sure. Um, it looks like we do have uh, one uh, comment in the in the chat. It says from Chris. Thank you, Chris. Hunting groups like Ducks Unlimited have traditionally been very involved with conservation and avoiding over hunting. Over hunting, excuse me. Likewise, game and fish departments in the various states. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that um, Barbara's surprise at the, the kind of parallels between environmentalists and hunters um, was based on her own um, sort of prejudicial expectations about who hunters were. And it was really powerful then for her to learn of a kind of um, depth of understanding that she was missing as she came into that situation. And um, I have another question and it's from Stephen. It says, could you repeat the categories you mentioned at the start? And Stephen, if you'd uh, like to unmute yourself and just um, uh, you can clarify for us if those are the categories for finding meaning, is that what you were? Well, I was interested in, uh, you, you mentioned a number of things that uh, um, you were looking at uh, in, in choosing the pictures and, and it, it, it went by fairly quickly. And so I was just, Curious, I wanted to be able to think about them a bit. Sure, no, I'd be happy to. So it was connection and isolation, wellness and illness, solace and discomfort, presence and absence, communal and domestic. And so we, I mean, we, we got to that group of paired terms by thinking first about the kinds of um, experiences that we were either missing or that felt very changed um, in the pandemic circumstance and, and how, to, how to identify photographs that would help us understand our own experience of the moment. And so, you know, I, I think I started with words like family um, and, and, and we were thinking about crowds and we were thinking about hands and, and, you know, because at that very first moment, I'm sure you all remember, there was all this paranoia about not touching things and, and could the virus be communicated by, you know, surfaces. And, and so, you know, through a good discussion, we came up with these more sophisticated conceptual ways of thinking about those ideas um, and, and how to then take those abstract ideas and go to the collection. And that was really then what each of us did individually was think about, you know, if I was going to try and show what wellness looked like, what, what pictures would I be looking for? Um, and actually, I worked with a, a studio photography class last year. Um, and we gave them the same assignment. So they took those sets of words and then they went to the CCP's online gallery and they looked for pictures that, that for them satisfied those kinds of ideas. And then we did a class presentation where they presented them to me and we talked about them. And it was really interesting to think about how, um, you know, pictures that functioned one way for the artist originally were now being seen by these students in a totally different way, given the circumstance and, and this particular assignment. 
I was curious, and, and the reason I asked was because it, it struck me that these give give great ideas for one's own photography. Mm. So I was thinking of, of, of personal projects. Oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's, I mean, it is, it's interesting to think about, isn't it? Like, what does wellness look like in a photograph? What would that, how would you indicate that? What would it mean? What would solace look like? Yeah, very interesting. Thank you, Stephen. Um, I have one more question for you, Becky. Um, and then, or actually, why don't we uh, put it to the crowd and see if anybody else has any more questions and then I can ask uh, my question while, while we wait for those to come in and that'll be our last one. Um, so for me, um, I was wondering if you could touch on the idea of photographs having different functions in different contexts and how the maker of the photograph might feel about those changes. Yeah, it's, I think that that's an interesting thing that curators grapple with um, because I think many artists would probably prefer that their artwork always stay in the context in which they originally create it or imagine it. So, um, you know, if the project, if Barbara's project is about hunting, then she maybe would ideally prefer that those pictures stay in that context. But, but that's often not what happens. You know, prints end up in museum collections or in private collections, and they take on new meanings based on what they're hung next to or, or what kinds of exhibitions they go into. And um, I've actually had these kinds of conversations with Mark Klett when I have used images in very personal exhibitions. Um, because, you know, he said, you, you've, you've repurposed this <laughs> photograph. And I said, yeah, it, when, when I'm doing a really personal exhibition, I think the exhibition does become in part about me and, and the way in which the exhibition is a creative expression of my thinking and how these images feel or, or, or behave in, in my mind. And, and then I put it into these new contexts where they have the potential to, to function in different ways. So, I mean, I think that artists can feel the way they feel, but they, they can't necessarily control what happens to their artworks when they go out into the world. We have one more question from the chat from Mary Jo. Um, why did Barbara decide to cut off the faces in most of the bird photos? Yeah, that's an excellent question. I, I, I think it was because the, the portrait is as much about the bird as it is about the person. But, but I think she was really wanting to concentrate on that point where the bird and the person come together. And so, I mean, we're drawn to faces as humans, we're drawn to look at faces. And I think by eliminating the faces in many of the pictures, then it, she's able to create a clear focus of the, the relationship between the hands and the bird that's being held. Um, because I think our, our instinct is to go to the eyes and to the face of the person. So I think it was an intentional choice to redirect our attention to the thing that she was interested in. Those, those pictures are made with a large format camera, which um, it's hard to take pictures of something that's happening I mean, she told me, and this is why I included this information, you know, sometimes the people would let go of the bird that, you know, they would say, I'm sorry, the bird's just too distressed and I can't, I'm not going to hold it longer for you to get the photograph. I need to let the bird go. Um, and she actually then began to photograph that in some instances, that process of the bird being released from the hands. Those are quite beautiful pictures too. Um, so it's, it's not, it's, it's not like looking through a camera with a viewfinder. You know, when you're working with a large format camera, you, you just don't have as precise a control as you do with a handheld camera. So I think there's also a little bit of um, flux in the way that those pictures are made that, that isn't completely within Barbara's control as the situation is evolving. Well, thank you again. 
Becky, so much. Um, and thank you to everybody who's here with us today. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, thank you for always joining us. For those of you who um, have joined us again for our third installment of the Curator's Corner, we have one more coming up in, um, or no, two more. We have two more coming up, one in next April and then one in May. And the next one is going to be on April 13th at 5 p.m. And that's going to be assist, uh, CCP Assistant Program Manager Brian Ganter. So really excited for that. Um, and please, please join us. Um, again, Becky, thank you so much to you for taking the time to do this with us today and for sharing your insights um, and your expertise. And um, to those who had questions in the chat about the recording, uh, we will be getting that up. Um, eventually, just keep an eye out on your emails. Um, we'll be announcing those. Um, and I look forward to seeing you all very soon. Okay. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks for coming. Have a good night, everyone.